Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is a very special day for us in the church. You can tell by the changing of the colors of the pyramids that we have here that it's a special day. It's Reformation Sunday. And so because it's Reformation Sunday, we're going to take a little bit of a break from our discipleship series and just focus on Reformation Sunday and what it means for us as Christians here today in, in the life that we're living now. This is a big moment for us in the church. It's a day that we remember because 501 years ago, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg Chapel door, which began the Reformation. It changed the course of the church. It changed the course of world history. The gospel of Jesus Christ had been present also from the very beginning of creation, from the very beginning of time when God created man in his image to when man fell into sin and God promised restoration through a son, through a Messiah. Everything that happened in the Old Testament led up to that moment to when Jesus Christ came into this world, took on our flesh, and walked this earth. Everything led up to that moment when he took our sins on the cross, suffered and died on our behalf, and rose again from the grave. And that gospel message is as true for us today as it was 2,000 years ago. But, during the time of Martin Luther, the truth of the gospel had been forgotten. And so this moment that we remember is when that Holy Spirit worked in the life of Luther and other reformers to remind them and us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so today, as we celebrate the Reformation, I want us to spend some time looking back at what was going on at that time, why this moment in time was so important, and also to see how this continues to impact us as children of the Reformation even today. But I'm going to start by us going back in time a little bit to the early 1500s. This was possibly the worst time in the history of the world to live, and I'm not exaggerating. If you know anything about the, about the, the world at the time of 1450 to 1550, it was awful place to live. It was a place of darkness, of fear, and of death. It was, it was a major place. Death was a major factor in, in that time period. We, death, we all know, is a part of life. Today, we know that. We know that all of us will die at some point. But today, if somebody dies under the age of 90, it is considered a tragedy. And, and to be fair, every single death for those who are left behind is certainly a tragedy. But it's rare today for us to deal with death. Now, some of you may be, some, there may be exceptions to this rule, but by and large, it's rare for us to deal with death. Usually, there'll be one person every three or four years that we are really close to, that we love really deeply, who dies. And so we, we interact with death, but we don't deal with it really on a daily basis in our culture today. In the early 1500s, death was an everyday occurrence. Do, do any of you have any idea what the, uh, uh, what the average age of a person was at that time, but when they died? 35. Close. 37. 37 years old. That means if I were to reach that level, if I, were, I have five more years to live and then I die, that means that a lot of you here in this room would be dead for 30 years. And for those of you who are young, high school seniors, half your life would have been lived at this point. That was just the reality of the day and the place where people lived. Death was present everywhere. There's a lot of reasons for that as well. One was infant, uh, infant mortality rates were incredibly high. Over 50% of people died before they turned three years old. So you almost inevitably had a brother or a sister who had died in infancy, or a son or a daughter who had died in infancy. It was just part of life. But it wasn't just that that was part of the problem. It was a violent, violent time as well. Now, we live in a very violent age. We just have to look and see the, what happened in Pittsburgh yesterday 
to be reminded of how violent the world we live in today is. But compared to the early 1500s, it's nothing. It was not uncommon for somebody to be out late at night, maybe have a little bit too much to drink, and to wake up in the morning dead. Or I guess not to wake up in the morning at all, just be found in the morning dead. And it was an adventure to travel from one town to the next. You took your life in your hands just moving from one village to the next because there were people who would rob you, who would beat you, who would kill you. Now today, we could say we take our lives in our hands every time we travel from one town to another. We could say we take our lives in our hands when we go from here to Mankato. And there's a level of truth to that, right? When you go on the road, who knows what can happen? A car accident can happen. But you're not worried about people driving you off the road and leaving you for dead. Just going from village to village, that's what life was like for people at that time. So it was a very violent time as well. But then also there's one other reason for the, the very young the, the amount of death that was present at that time. And that was that it was a time of great sickness. The plague was running rampant at that time. There were, there were towns in the, early, in the late 1400s, early 1500s that would be hit with the plague and a year later would completely be wiped off the map because 90% of the inhabitants had died from the plague. That was just part of life. Death was everywhere. But it wasn't just that Death was everywhere that made that time of life hard. It was also a time of great poverty and great illiteracy and ignorance. About 5% of the population were considered wealthy, royalty, or nobility of some kind. The other 95% lived in poverty. And they were not educated. They, were not, they did not learn Latin, which was the, the language of education. And most of them couldn't even read German or English or whatever language they spoke. It was a dark time for that reason. But I, all those things I just mentioned, the thing that made that the darkest time was the level of fear that people lived with. And the fear didn't come from death. That was a normal part of life. It didn't come from poverty. The fear largely came from the teachings of the church. Because the church had forgotten the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they'd replaced it with something else completely. There were a number of pieces of theology that were being taught that were just completely unscriptural, that the people believed because they were illiterate. They couldn't open God's word to read the Bible for themselves, and so what the church said went. And so I want to share with you a few of those things that caused fear in the life of people. One of them was, was this idea. It was a very famous saying at the time, where people would say, do the best that you can and let Christ take care of the rest. Now, some of you may hear that and say, well, what's pastor? What's so wrong with that? That sounds good. Do the best that you can and let Christ take care of the rest. But when you really dig into what, they're, what that saying meant, it meant you do the best that you can. You do the works that you can. You be a good person. And if you do not be, be the best person that you can be, then Christ will not take care of the rest. You have to go so far before Christ will do anything for you. That was a very prominent teaching at that time. And it put all the responsibility on the individual to do good works. And that belief was you can never save yourself completely, but if you did not do the absolute best you could, well then, too bad for you. Of course, there were other teachings as well. One of them was this idea of penance, which some things, you may hear about that sometimes today as well, but the idea of penance was that you, you were sinful. And somebody had to pay for those sins. And the person that had to pay for those sins was you. And so you would go and you confess your sins to the priest, and then the priest would give you something to do as penance. Maybe it was to say certain prayers, maybe it was to give alms to the poor, maybe it was to fast or to, or to, uh, to walk up stairs on your knees. And then there are other extremes of penance where people would become monks and nuns as part of their penance to live a holy life so they can do the best they could so they can have salvation. And then there was the utter extreme where there were some people who would take whips and beat themselves into a bloody mess to try to purge themselves from their sin as part of their penance. But the idea behind the penance was once again, you have to do something to make up for your sin for God to love you. And then there came up another idea 
This idea of purgatory, which has no place in scripture whatsoever, but this idea of purgatory became very, very prominent at the time. And the idea of purgatory was that while you walk this earth, you would do the best that you could, but you'd still be sinful. You would do penance, but you would not be able to make up for all of your sin. So when you died, there was still sin that had to be paid for. And so you would go not to hell and not to heaven. You'd go to some in-between place, a place called purgatory. And while you were there, you would work off the rest of your sin. You would do the rest of your penance while you were in purgatory. And you could not avoid purgatory. It was part of life. You can imagine with all of those teachings that people were learning, why they were so afraid. They can never know if they'd done enough work to, to let Christ do the rest. They never known if they had done a penance. They never knew if they were going to have to be in purgatory for a year or 10,000 years. And so they lived in great fear. What was interesting is the Catholic Church came up with one other piece of theology to try to help fix this fear a little bit. In the early 1500s, there was a pope, a man named Leo, who decided that he wanted to build a beautiful new church, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. All of you have probably seen pictures of this church. It's one of the most beautiful churches in the world. Some of you have probably actually been there before as well. But the Catholic Church did not have the money to pay for this church, this building. And so they had to find a way to, to, to raise money to pay for it. And somebody, I don't know who, had a grand idea of, I know what we'll do. We'll write a piece of paper that says people will be freed from their sin, and the Pope will sign it, and we'll sell it to people. And then they'll be able to be free from purgatory. And so they, they did this. It was, this, it was called indulgences. And they would go, there would be people who would go from town to town selling these indulgences. And the idea behind them was, if you had sinned so much, you can pay to have your sins wiped out, and then you can go to heaven right away when you died. Or if you had loved ones who had died before who were suffering in purgatory, you can pay for pen, uh, indulgence for them and release them from purgatory so they can go straight to heaven. And so what they ended up saying was, now you can buy your salvation with your money. It was into this world that Martin Luther was born, and it was into this world that led Martin Luther back to the truth of the gospel. He was a man of his time. He was a man who lived in poverty as a young man, but whose dad found a way to get him educated. He was a brilliant man. And so he quickly stood out from the rest of the students, and he became a doctor of the church. But he was also a man who greatly who lived his life until 1517, in complete and utter fear. Because Luther was convinced that he was going to go to hell. He was convinced that even though he was a monk, even though he was doing the best that he could, even though he did penance better than anyone, that he was going to hell. He actually said later on in life, if anybody could get to heaven by being a good monk, I would have been able to do it. He was the best monk there was, and yet he constantly lived in fear of whether he had done enough. His life was filled with penance. He would, he would, people were so concerned with him because how he fasted and prayed that they thought he was going to kill himself from starving himself, from mal malnutrition. He was one of those people who took that extreme form of purging himself from sin and whipped himself into a bloody mess at night trying to purge himself from sin. And he constantly was going back to his confessor, confessing his sin over and over and over again. He would go and confess his sin and turn around and come back 30 seconds later because he had, he had done something sinful in that time frame. And he was worried that he would die with that sin on his conscience. It was so bad that one time one of his confessors actually told him, Martin, go and commit an actual sin and then come back and confess to me. But he lived in constant fear. But as I said, he was a professor of the of the church. And so he studied God's word because he had to teach young men the Bible. And as he began to read certain passages of scripture, the Holy Spirit opened up his eyes to see the truth of the gospel that the church had lost. He began to read passages like Ephesians 2.8, which says, for it, is by work, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not by works so that no man can boast. And passages like today's epistle lesson from Romans 3, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. 
And as Luther began to read these passages, he began to realize all the things that the church was teaching were just not true. They were not teaching the gospel at all. They were teaching something completely different. It was through the reading of Scripture that the Spirit opened his eyes to see that the, the, the way for salvation is not through the works that you do. The way for salvation is not through what price you can pay to the church to forgive you. The way to salvation is not through penance. The way to through salvation is not to do the best that you can do and let Christ take care of the rest. The way to salvation was the cross of Jesus Christ. It was letting Christ not do the rest, letting Christ do everything. Letting Christ be the one who sets you free. Letting Christ be the one who gives you salvation. Letting Christ be the one who, who wipes away your sins so you don't, have to do, you don't have to do the work to make yourself sinless. He did it for you. And it was through the reading of God's word that Martin Luther saw that and his life was changed. And through the rest of the course of his life, he continued to proclaim the gospel to anyone who would listen. That life came through the cross of Jesus Christ and the empty grave. That salvation came through the grace of God and not through one's works. And through him and through many other reformers in the early church, the Spirit of God worked and moved, and the gospel of Jesus Christ became the thing that people knew and trusted in because it was the one thing that brought life. And today, brothers and sisters in Christ, that Reformation is as valuable to us today as it was 500 years ago. Because the, the truth of the Word of God is as true now as it was then. There are times in our life where we may feel like we have to do something to earn God's favor. But we read passages like this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and we are reminded that it is by grace we've been saved through faith not by works. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. God does it for you freely. There are times where we still, even as redeemed sinners, fall short of the glory of God. But as we read the gospel and we read the story of God and we read, we hear passages like 1 John chapter 1 that says, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And our doubts and our fears that maybe we've not done enough, which sometimes we struggle with, we hear passages like today, where we hear that all fall short of the glory of God, but are justified as a gift. That is the legacy of the Reformation. And the Reformation is still real and alive for us today. Because the Reformation is about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the saving work that is done by him. And it's that reformation message, it's that gospel message that we live in and that the world needs to hear today as well. When we see things happen like happened in Pittsburgh yesterday, that is a reminder of the broken world we live in. And there are many things we can talk about, solutions to the problem, to fix things. And there'll be many things that you'll hear people talking about, political changes, uh, legislative changes that can be done to keep people safe. But the truth of the matter is, the only thing that changes a broken world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the thing that brings us salvation. That's the thing that brings us hope in the midst of a broken world. When we see horrible, awful things happen, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so today, as we celebrate the Reformation, we celebrate what God did 500 years ago through the person of Martin Luther and the other reformers. But we celebrate that the Reformation is still alive and well in us today. And that through the power of the gospel, it brings healing and life to a broken world. Amen. And now may the God of grace and mercy be with you and strengthen you as you walk in him. Amen.